Last week we started the uh, the series uh, How to Know, and we've been talking about you know what this series is about is how to know what to do, how to know the will of God, how to know which way to go, or what decision to make, or what option to pick, or we can we can put that into so many different ways. And uh, today I want to uh, talk to you about a square peg in a round hole. And that might not make a whole lot of sense right now, but stay tuned. <laughs> stay, stay hooked up, keep your ears open, and, and it'll make sense here. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 2, 9 and 10. This is our foundation scripture where we... We're kind of starting from for this series. and Let's read it together. 1 Corinthians 2, nine. it says, But as it is written, eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love Him. And a lot of people will read this verse and they'll say, See, we don't know. How can we know? God is not, you know, that, that we don't know. The Scripture tells us that. But you can't stop reading with one verse, right? Because the Bible wasn't written in chapter and verse. It was written as letters, as a one continuous thing. When one chapter ends, the thought, the theme, the, the discussion continues on into the next chapter or the next verse. So let's keep reading here. It says, But God has revealed them to us through His Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. So these things, these answers that we want, that we desire, that we're looking for, they are revealed. And so we can know them. They are not hidden from us. They're hidden for us so that we can find them. That we're not going to just stumble along and, and pick them up as we walk along and, you know, as we go along this faith journey. And, you know, they're just not going to be laying on the sidewalk waiting for us. We have to search them out. And they'll be revealed to us. They're, re, they're hidden for us. All right. Last week, we talked about, you know, kind of the last week and this week are kind of our foundation or, you know, we got to kind of lay a foundation for this series before we get into the practical how to. So we got to start with, a, with the basics of it, with the foundation of it. And we talked about how that number one, we got to stop whining and complaining. When we're, when we go to prayer and we say, Lord, I need an answer. How are we going to Him? Are we going to Him saying, Oh Lord, I need an answer. You know, we're just crying and whining. I gotta know. I gotta know. Give me an answer. What do I do? And we just say, or there's a situation going on in our life. We have an illness. We have financial problem or a, or a uh, relationship that's going south. And, and we just go to God and we say, Why God? Why? We just keep asking why. Well, Lord, why are these things happening? Why are you doing these two things to me? Why are these things happening? That kind of whining, complaining is not going to get you your answer. Because God is never moved. He, is not, uh, he does not react to our need, nor to our whining. To our complaining. To our asking why all the time. He does not, He is not Moved by those things. What is he moved by? Let's say it together. Faith. He's moved by our faith. When we trust and believe what he has said, what he has declared, what he has promised, then in his word, then, then that will move him. That will cause him, or not cause him, that will uh, bring about the answer that, that we want from him. All right? So we talked about that we need to start with what we know. What do we know? Don't Focus on what you don't know. Don't focus on what you don't have. Focus on what you know. What do we know? What do we know about the word from the Word of God? What God thinks about that situation? It's if it's sickness in your body. What do we know? That it's God's will to heal every time. Not sometimes, maybe depends on whether you're righteous enough, whether you're good enough, whether you got your, your act all good. No, His will is to heal every single time, all the time. And it's our place is to, to believe that and receive that. And when we do that, then we'll have the answer to it. All right. So start with what you know. The next thing is to what's in your house or what do you have in your hand? What's available to you? Because a lot of times the answers to questions that we have are very mundane, very everyday practical stuff. And we're perplexed by things and we need answers. We need to know what's going on. 
Well, we can't say we don't know if we know the one who knows everything. If we know the Holy Spirit who knows everything, how can we say we don't know when we know someone that does know? It's like saying, I don't know how to fix a car, but I have a best friend who's a mechanic who's been at it for years and years, and I know he knows, but I don't go and ask him. And so I sit at home whining and complaining, I don't know how to fix my car. I, don't know how to, I can't get to work, I can't go to the store, I can't go to my friend's house, I can't make it to church because I can't fix my car. But we won't go, do, we won't go ask the one who does know. And so it's the same thing with, with every area of life that the Holy Spirit can lead us and guide us into the answers that we want. All right, let's get into what, we're, what we want to talk about today. Square peg in a round hole. Do you ever notice that the that we may know the will of God? This is the, the next foundation that we need to get into here, the next thing, is that we know the will of God. We know that God's will is to heal. We know that God's will is to provide for us. That you know, Paul said that my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. And 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 the context of that is financial, that God will meet our financial needs. And so, we know these things. We know the will of God. We know it's God's will to heal us. We know it's God's will to provide for us. But our life doesn't line up. It doesn't match up. It's that, you know, God's will is the round hole in our, in our life. What's going on in our life is that square peg, and they don't match up. So, what do we do? How do we, how do we know? How do we, yeah, what do we do? How do we how do we get to, to the place where we can not only know the will of God but actually get it working in our lives and get it uh, operating in us? So I got a little video for you to kind of illustrate what most believers do in this case when the when the will of God is that round hole and their lifestyle or what's going on in their life is that square peg. This is what most believers, most Christians do. but they don't get the answers that they need. And I thought that was just perfect for what we try to do. We try to get what's going on in our life, the, the, the lack or the, the fact that we don't have answers, that we don't know what to do, we don't, we don't have healing in our body, and we don't have the finances we need. We try to just cram it in. We try to form, make the will of God fit our lifestyle when we need to change our lifestyle so it fits the will of God. And it's not comfortable because, you know, when you have a square peg, the only one way it's going to fit into a round hole is that you've got to make it round. You've got to knock the edges off. You've got to tr be changed, be transformed. You've got to make a change in your life. And when we get so bogged down and so, or not bogged down, when we get so uh, used to doing things the way we do them, you know, I, I have my way of doing things. I have my way of believing. I have my way of, of uh, thinking about what God's like and what He thinks and what He likes and doesn't like. You know, I have my way of doing things. And when we're, that's it. That's, what we're, that's our square peg. And now we're going to force it to fit the will of God. And we're going to try to manipulate God through prayer and through faith and through, you know, using faith principles and through confession and through all these different things, and, and we're going to try to manipulate God into, into uh, conforming to our, our lifestyle or our way of thinking and our way of doing, that that's the results we get, is we just destroy everything. Nothing actually fits. Nothing actually works. But when a true peg fits in a true hole, it is smooth and accurate and, and um, 
a, a joy to do. It is when we're lined up with the will of God, when we have His will, we know, we know what He wants, and then we change our side of things so that we line up with His will, and then we can receive the answers that we need. Let's go to Isaiah 1 and 19. You there yet? Isaiah 1 and 19. I didn't even give you time to even begin to look, did I? Come on, let's go. Let's get there. Now I need you. I need you to look at it in your in your own Bible on your own phone. You gotta you gotta get your eyes on the Word of God. It's important, not just what's up here on the screen, but you gotta you gotta see it for yourself in your own Bible, because then you know. It says Isaiah one nineteen. It says, "If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land." And this is a promise of God. This is a a simple uh, principle. A simple um, declaration that God declared through the prophet Isaiah that if you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. So what is this eating the good of the land? Well, that's while we're living on this earth, while we're walking and sucking oxygen and taking in calories and, and burning energy and all that kind of stuff and releasing uh, carbon monoxide and you know we're living on this earth. While we're doing that, we can have two ways of a lifestyle. We can have one that is in lack and disappointment and we never have enough and we never have the things that we truly want or desire. We never have all the things that make us, that make life enjoyable. But the other way is that we can eat the good of the land. We can have good things. We can have days of heaven on earth, the scripture tells us. And so, you know, in heaven there is no sickness or disease. Well, we know that we can have the good of the land, which is healing and prosperity. And so, if we're going to have these things, there's two requirements in the, the, that are brought up in this verse, verse, is to be willing and obedient. So, here's my question to you today. Are you willing to be conformed into a round peg so that you'll fit in God's round hole? Or are you going to be like that little kid and just beat it in and destroy it all? The, the, your response to the will of God is crucial to you getting the answers and the stuff, the healing, the financial provision, the uh, soundness of mind, the removing of strife, in your family, in your relationships with your friends, the um, I want to say the word comfort of your heart, but you know the, the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, "I'll send you another Comforter," but we've got to conform to that and receive that comfort. If if we want to be comforted, <laughs> then we need to receive the Comforter. And the, uh, say that all three times fast. That's why I was struggling to say it first time right. Um, so if we want just peace in our life, just, uh, pardon me? Yeah, lack, just soundness of mind. We don't have, we're not depressed. We don't, we're not sad days. We're not having sad days that turn into weeks, that turn into months, that turn into years, that turn into a lifetime of just sadness, of just being depressed and, and distracted and defeated and you know, if we want victory in every area of life, then we've got to be willing and obedient. So what does this mean to be willing? If we're willing, then if we're saying, Lord, I need an answer. How do I know? How to know what we don't know? And we've got to be willing that when we get the answer, that we're willing to conform to it. Because most of the time, and I've just, just from years of being a believer and just years of asking God about for answers in multiple different situations for multiple things, it always comes down, or most likely comes down, that the answer is not what you expect. The answer usually comes in the form of an instruction to do something, and then we've got to be willing to do that instruction 
And we've got to be obedient to do it the way He instructed us to do it. Remember Joshua when he took over for uh, Abraham, or for Abraham, Abraham, no, for Moses, whew, get all my characters mixed up. When Joshua took over the ruling or the, the leading of the children of Israel into the promised land, God told him that if he kept his eyes on the word, if he kept his, let's go there. Joshua 1. I'm, I'm going to say it incorrectly and I don't want to and I wasn't expecting to go there. And this is what the Lord instructed him to do. In verse 7, Joshua 1 and verse 7, it says, only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do it according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. So this was Joshua's instruction. And this is good instruction to any believer. That if you'll do what, what Joshua was instructed to do, I believe this is applicable to any believer in any situation. Because it's foundational. It's, you know, he says, the book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, and you will observe to do according to all that is written in it. Those things, if you do those things, you're going to pretty much have every answer you need. They may not be you know it immediately right now when you need it, but you have access to the source of it, and that is to the Word of God, what you're meditating on, what you're speaking, what, you're, what, is, what is in you, coming out of you. You know, you keep putting it in, and then it keeps coming out by what you speak. And you are doing it. Say, I'm a doer. I'm a doer of the Word of God. Now, why do we want to be doers of the Word of God? Because it's only doers that get results. If you're a hearer, as James said, if you're a hearer only, you don't get results. You don't get successful outcome. Only doers of the Word of God get successful outcomes. All right. Willing and obedient. Are you willing? No matter what the instruction is, no matter what the answer is, no matter what God comes back and, and you are you are praying, Lord, I need this, I need this, I need this. Let me give you an example. Kenneth Copeland, way back when their ministry was small, in comparison to what it is today, um, you know they they only had a you know a handful of employees and you know only a few hundred partners and you know they were just in their beginning stages and they were. He was financially in a trouble. He, he, he said, I need a million dollars. And so he kept going to prayer week after week, day after day, I need a million dollars. Lord, I need a million dollars. And so he got away for three days, spent time in prayer and fasting, and, and that, was the, that was what he kept coming to God with. I need a million dollars. How do I get a million dollars? I need a million dollars. And the Lord said, you don't need a million dollars. And Kenneth Coleman was like, you could have fooled me. He said, because the... Pay, the bills are stacking up, the TV time, the radio you know, time, whatever, just payroll, paying people, doing the, you know, the work of ministry. And the Lord said, you don't need a million dollars because if I gave you a million dollars in a short period of time, you'd be right back where you are because the root problem is not being fixed. And the root problem was you need to tithe. The ministry needs to tithe and to be a giver and a sower. So he made that correction. He made that change. Within a few months, the money came in. They got up, you know, back up, back in the black. You know, they were in the red, and they got back into the black and, and went on from there, and they learned a principle. So when you go to God and you say, God, I need this. I need an answer about this. He may come back to you and say, 
what you really need is this foundation, this you need to make this change. You've got this square peg that's not fitting in my round hole and you need to start knocking off some edges. And you need to start grounding that thing off so that it fits the will of God, so it fits what the, what the answer is. And so if we'll do those, if we're willing to do those things and we're obedient to do them, now if Kenneth Copeland would have said, I don't think a ministry should have to tithe. I don't think a church, a ministry, we're receiving offerings from people, that's their tithes or their offerings into the ministry. We shouldn't have to then again be tithers and givers on top of that. I mean, we're in the business of receiving offerings and then doing the work of ministry. We're not in the business of giving offerings to someone else. If he would have had that attitude, then that million dollar problem would not have gone away and it would have been still there. God didn't just say, okay, here's a million dollars, but he started the work of transforming people's lives and people's hearts so that that they would... uh, I'm, I'm getting down a trail that I don't want to go. It's okay. Get my brain back to where <laughs> where I'm supposed to be. So for us, if if we go to God and He He says I want you to do this, and we say, well, I'm not willing to do that, then you're not going to have the answer you want, and the problem's going to fester, and it's just going to keep getting worse. It's not going to stay the same. It's going to get worse. It's like Lord, I, I, I need to fix my car. My car is acting up. It sounds weird. You know, it, it, it needs fixed. What should I do? And we want him to say, take it to a mechanic and get this fixed. But what he'll come back and say is, well, what I need you to do is to help so-and-so make a payment on their car payment. And you're like, what? What does that have anything to do with my car getting fixed? What does that have anything to do with with the problem that I have and the answer that I need. And he's like, because if you'll get your heart in the right place, if you'll be willing and obedient, then I'll take care of the car. And so often we want to, we want to get so fixated on the problem at hand. What we, what we observe to be the, the situation or the problem that we need answers for, that we need provision for, that we need healing for, or whatever. And and we... Let me give you another example. You can be struggling with depression or with sorrow because of a lost loved one, because of whatever is going on in your life, and you can be sad. I don't know how else to say it. You're just in that state of sadness and depression. You just feel like there's a cloud hanging over you all the time. And you're like, Lord, I need Your joy. I need Your, your grace and Your joy in my life. Lord, what do I do? How do I, how do I get this joy? The joy of the Lord is my strength, but I don't seem to have any joy. What do I do? And the Lord says, He answers you and He gives you an opportunity to serve somewhere. To volunteer and to do something for somebody else. And you go, no, no, I'm too busy in my problem. I got, I got to get this straightened out. Then I can go and serve that and do that. So the answer comes, but you're not willing, nor are you obedient to do that thing. But if we'll go over there and do that, we'll, we'll volunteer, we'll serve, we'll help somebody else out, then we'll find that the joy of the Lord comes. We'll, we'll find that His joy comes not in the mailbox. You know what I mean? It doesn't come like He mails it to us or He somehow imparts it into us, but it comes when we serve others. You want to get rid of depression and anxiety and worry and all that. Start serving somebody else. Start giving to somebody else. And you'll have that. Financial problems. You'll go to the Lord and say, Lord, I, I got a real bad problem. I don't have enough money. I got too much month. Not enough money. You know, I need you to, to, to increase my income. That, that'll fix my problem. If I could just get a raise, if I could just get a better job, if I could just get more money, then that'll take care of the problem. And the Lord says, in His Word, He says, give and it'll be given to you. 
He says, be generous and, and bless other people and it will be given to you. And you're like, no, no, if I had more income, then I could be a giver. If I had more income, then I could tithe and I could be generous. If I, if I had more income, then all these other problems would take care of themselves. And that's not how it works. That's not how, if we go through Scripture, that's not how the Lord works. He works in what you have. What do you have in your hand? What do you have available to you? What do you know and what do you have? And if you'll take them and use them, and if you're willing and obedient with them, then He'll provide the increase. He'll provide the blessing. All right, does any of that make sense? Is any of that good? Is that, everybody's kind of like, uh, uh, maybe, sure, okay, square peg, round hole, yeah, okay. All right, let's go to Hebrews 12 and 1. One more scripture and we'll... Bring this sucker in for a landing. Hebrews 12 and 1. Now, like I was saying earlier, that the Bible was not written in chapter and verse the way we have it. It was broken up into chapters and verses for ease of finding things for to make it easy for us to use it and read it and do all that. To read our chapters. We couldn't read our chapters every day if it wasn't broken up into chapters and verses. No. That's, okay. Anyhow, so chapter 12 is just a continuation of chapters 10 and 11. That it's the hall of faith. Chapter 11 is what is referred to as the hall of faith. It's all the people, like, you know, if you, if you get down through that... Um, says, by faith Abel obtained, wit obtained a witness. By faith Enoch uh, had, his, had his testimony. Um, by faith Noah became the heir of righteousness. Um, by faith Abraham obeyed. And, and uh, by faith Sarah received her, you know, received the child. And it just goes on and on. All these different people that by faith they accomplish things. So we call that the Hall of Faith. This is all the Old Testament and New Testament characters of what they did by faith to receive what they needed. And so chapter, chapter 12, verse 1 is just the continuation of that thought and of, of all that. And it says, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Well, who are these cloud of witnesses? That's all the Hall of Faith. That's all chapter 11. It says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And so this is an instruction to us. If we want to have the outcome, the results that all these Hall of Famers did, all these faith, Hall of Faithers did, you know, if we want to have the same outcome and results and the same success that they had, then we need to do what they did. Let us lay aside the weight that so easily ensnares us. You know, we can, we can go to God and, and just beg and plead for Him to give us the answers and we keep trying to stuff that square peg in that round hole. God, I need an answer. God, I need an answer. And He says, I need you to set, us, set this aside. I need you to lay down this weight, this sin that is so easily tripping you up and prevents me from blessing you. God will bless us to the maximum that He can. But if we allow sin to prevail in our life, we allow the devil to keep lying to us and, and tripping us up and causing us to stumble, and we keep allowing Him to keep um, tripping us up, then we're, God can't bless us. He can't get into our lives. It's, it's like I was saying about uh, you know, when one person has a hold of something and says, I can't make this work, I can't get this to work, and there's somebody standing right there beside them that can do it, and it's like, well, you've got to put it down. You've got to take your hands off of it and allow God to put His hands on it. And so when we lay that sin aside, we are not... That, that, what, is, what is being said is not, you take care of that sin. You lay that weight aside and then you take care of it. The, what it is saying is, are you willing and are you obedient? 
And because when we make that first step, you know what I mean? It's like, like God says, you need to take care of this, this situation, whatever it is, this ongoing, annoying, reoccurring sin in your life. And it can be the simplest thing of being a gossip or being in strife or not being forgiving or, you know, it can, it can go on and on and on to, to all the thing, all the things that go on in our life. And when we keep a hold of that, then God can't take care of it. But when we read from the Word of God that we need to lay those things down and we make that step, that commitment to that, that's when the anointing, the ability, the empowerment of God comes in and on us and empowers us to do that. But if we're going to try to do it by our own strength and our own power, and we're going to, by our own willpower, we're going to, we're going to put this thing down, then it's going to beat us up every time. It's, you know, it's like the, the smoker that quits smoking a hundred times. You know, he's, he's thrown away more packs of cigarettes than he can count. He's, you know, uh, dug them back out of the garbage can. And, you know, I was there, not smoking, but chewing. You know, throw it away, be frustrated and mad. I am not going to do this anymore. I am going to be, I'm going to lay this thing down and I'm going to do this right. And then next thing I know, I'm like a pig in a swaller digging that thing back out. And, but it's when I finally made that decision, Lord, it is your word that says it and I'm going to be obedient to your word. I am willing to be obedient. That's when the empowerment of God came in and I was able to step away from it. It didn't make it easy. It still wasn't like cakewalk. Like, oh, you know, no, I don't want to do that no more. No, I still wanted to do it. In the worst kind of way. But I had the ability to say no. Where when I was doing it in my own willpower, my own strength, I couldn't say no. It was, you ever see those commercials they have on? It's a young guy in a theater and he's, you know, he's going to take a dip of snuff and it's this monster that, you know, overtakes him and, and, you know, pulls his mouth open and shoves it in kind of, it's just like, that's what it seems like. It's just like you're just, you're powerless against it. But yet, when we are willing and obedient, when we are willing, like, you know, there's times when we are truly not willing. But if we're willing to be willing, don't let that wording trip you up. If we're willing to be, Lord, I'm willing. I know I'm not willing in this area right now, but I am willing to be willing. So what do I got to do? How do I get there? How do I, don't try to bite it off in one big chew. Don't eat the elephant one, you know, in one big lump. Take them one bite at a time. How do I get there? How do I, what's the steps I need to do? I'm willing to be willing, but now how do I get to that place where I am truly in a state of being willing, state of willingness to where I can be obedient to what the instruction is? All right. So this Hebrews 11 1, it says, therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. This, we've got to understand that not only once we are willing and obedient, but it's a race. It's a constant uh, endeavor. It's something that we must keep doing over and over again, all the time, we just got to keep pressing into it. We got to keep putting our hands to it. It's not something we can do once and then it's all done, but it's something we've got to stay in. And so we got to run this race with endurance or with patience, with diligence, with um, perseverance, and you know all those word adjectives we can use with that. We've got to run this way race with endurance. This race of faith, this walk of faith that we walk out every day, our, you know, he says we are to work out our own salvation. That's a, that's a process. Salvation is not a one-time event. We can look back and say, that's the day I got saved. That's the day I got born again. And this is what I did and who I was with and where it was and what time of the day it was and all that kind of stuff. But now from, from that point on, we are working out our salvation. We are developing and, and moving along and God is, is uh, doing a work in us. Alright, so endurance. Endurance is not 
being the best. It's like I never ran cross country in, in high school. I was in track, and I was never good at anything, so they stuck me on the pole vaulting team. <laughs> I couldn't throw anything. I couldn't run fast. I couldn't run far. I couldn't, I couldn't throw anything very well. I wasn't coordinated enough to do that. And so I tried out the pole vaulting. I enjoyed it, so that's where I stuck. But the, the, uh, the cross-country guys intrigued me because these guys would run for hours. You know, they would, they would go out and run, just run and run and run and run. It's like, I don't even want to run from here to the, to the shower. You know, I just, running was not one of my, it still is not one of my favorite things to do. And obviously, I'm a, I'm a trained runner. <laughs> but it's, once you get into it and you get a rhythm to it and you, if you start running on a, on a consistent basis, you know, three times a week or, you know, some people run every day and, and you find that as you give yourself to it and you, and you train yourself and you, um, how do I want to say it? You force yourself to do it. You be willing and obedient. Obedience sometimes, obedience is not, obedience is not agreeing with something. Obedience is doing it when you don't agree, when you don't like it, when you don't want to do it, when you don't have the want to, but you do it anyhow. That's obedience. And so this endurance was these cross-country runners. Here's this kid who's last of the last. You know what I mean? He's, he's not just last in the pack. He is last way back in the pack. But yet, he is still running. And those guys, I had an admiration for them. It's like, why don't you just quit? You're, you're never going to win the race. You're never even going to come in 10th place in the race. You are way back. You're not even back. You're back back. You know, I mean, it's like you're not even in the back of the bus. You're on the outside pushing the bus. I mean, this guy's like so far back that everybody has forgotten that he's even there. And when everybody's done, everybody's crossed the finish line, then everybody's got to wait for this guy. You know, why didn't he just quit and walk the straight line to the finish line instead of going through the course? Why didn't he just quit? Because he had endurance. Because he had a commitment and an obedience to do what he came there to do. He came there to run that race, to run that course, and to finish it. And he gave everything he had. You know, the the uh, marathon, like the Boston Marathon or the New York Marathon or whatever, you know, there's all those guys that go out in the beginning. There's hundreds of runners, and but there's always those last, those guys that are way in the back, and they have endurance. And it's it's not the not the guys that finish first that do it in record time and all that 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 I have admiration for. I mean, it's amazing what they do, but it's those people that. I watch these um, triathlons where you swim, run, and bike. And here's this 80-year-old woman who's doing this race, and and she's getting it done. She's not, you know, she's way back. She's last. She's barely making it in there, but she's making it, and she has tremendous endurance. Was, remember the one lady? She's 80-year-old nun. And she was, she was putting it, picking them up and putting them down. And she was doing amazing things. You know, here's guys that are, uh, military and they have prosthetics and they're in these races, you know, doing these, um, triathlons and, you know, the endurance that it takes to do that kind of stuff. And so often we think that, well, once I get it all together, once I get my life straightened out, once I am, uh, all put together, then I can run this race of faith and I can get into this Christian life and do good at it. I can be successful. But I gotta get all this, all this baggage taken care of and get all this stuff. And that's not how it gets done. That's not how it accomplishes. You gotta get into the race now. And even if you trip and fall, I spilt my tea earlier, you know, it's like you make a mess. You know, you, you get, you come out of the, 
the, the gun goes off and you start to race and you're tripping and falling and stumbling and having to pick yourself up, and, but you just keep running. And when you run with endurance like that, when you get to the end, there's a prize and the prize is the answer that you're looking for. The prize is how to know, to know what you don't know. And you will, you will receive that if you'll stay faithful and obedient and run your race with endurance.